Hello YouTube, my name is Patrick and this is my channel 1984. Today we have a HP system, it's a Huel Packard Vectra XU, it's a dual Pentium Pro system with SCSI drives. We are going to take a look at this system and uh, do some uh, upgrades. The owner of the system would like to have this uh, machine serviced and uh, upgraded somewhat. He would like to have a graphics card supporting transformation and lighting, so that uh, would probably be a GeForce 2 MX card, he, because he wants uh, the drives also to support SMT for some uh, games of his. He also wants uh, the hard drives replaced. Uh, this the system uses SCSI drives, uh, some are failing. And uh, there is some issues with uh, posting with certain graphics card. So we're gonna look into how we're gonna resolve that because uh, apparently it's got stuck on the uh, SCSI controller using some graphics cards he wants to use. So we're gonna look into maybe replacing the SCSI card, replacing the hard drives, the graphics card, and also add uh, a sound card. The system does have built-in sound, but uh, he wants a different card. We're probably gonna look into do some uh, recapping on some parts of the system if needed. So yeah, let's take a look at the system and see if it boots. So here we are then, and I'm gonna turn the system on. Okay, something has obviously happened to the system while it's been sitting here. Couldn't boot, so... As we mentioned, the hard drives were dying, so that could probably be it. So we're probably looking at a reinstall already. I would like to try to get into the BIOS here to see what we're dealing with. Uh, we have dual Pentium Pro 200 MHz, uh, 256 GB of cache, that's L2. Uh, you can have up to one megabyte, uh, but that's like it's integrated into the CPU. It has its own uh, L2 cache die, so you would have to swap both CPUs for more cache. You got half a gig of ECC memory, and I checked all the DIMM slots are populated. No ID drives detected. Yeah. So what I'm looking f to do later, if it's actually it's correct that it can't boot uh, with some VGA cards uh, with the onboard SCSI, it gets stuck there. So, but I do have other SCSI cards we're gonna try. Uh, so hopefully we could just do some more modern SCSI card, I think. Get some upgrades there with the new drives anyway. So we're probably gonna disable the SCSI interface, uh, onboard one later, and maybe onboard sound too if we can do that, because it wants a uh, fancier sound cards uh, yeah that's supposed to be like a sound blaster 16 compatible card and the rdqs and dma seems to line up with that yeah so i suppose instead of booting up windows and shaking stuff there we just have to get straight into te tearing it down basically and try to make it work with the stuff he wants in it so here we have the system at the bottom uh, we have three isa slots as you can see and above that we have four pci slots now you can't see the cpus but it's a duct on the top with a fan above the power supply that duct duct goes to the first cpu on the top just behind it and then below the power supply uh, once we start turning down the system later uh, we're gonna be able to see the CPUs because the owner wants the computer cleaned, like everything, and up, and recaps were needed 
but right now we're gonna try to see if we can find some parts for it that it, that it will work with like a graphics card sound card SCSI cards uh, new new drives and so on so that's the next thing to do for parts uh, we have a few graphics cards to choose from but i picked this one out because it's the oldest it's a geforce 4 mx of some type i think 64 megabytes so it's not the geforce 2 uh, it was the oldest one he sent with the system uh, it's pci obviously because we have no agp so we're gonna be trying that one first but we have another geforce 4 i think mx and uh, or GeForce 4000, but I think those are basically GeForce 4s. Um, then we have a couple of adapter cards here. Uh, I think they're the same. I have them myself. It's uh, 19160 cards. So it's an it's a Ultra 160 cards, so 160 megabits per second. But it's PCI, obviously. I do think they can do 66 megahertz, so I should, in theory, be able to push that on that proper board. So you have your 68 pin connector here. You got the 50 pin here, and these cards uh, were actually sold often with the cables included with terminators. So you ran your SCSI CD-ROM there, and you ran your hard drives here. And I use one in my pencil tray just like that, and it's uh, really nice because it supports boot from CD-ROM or from optical drive. So. That's nice. Uh, now we don't have any SCSI optical drives with, uh, with the parts here, so we're gonna use an ID for now, but uh, it's a nice way to upgrade to SCSI there. And we got the second one just in case there's some issue. And I suppose you can run two of them, but uh, I don't know why. Uh, one of these cards can support, I think, like, you know, it's 15 drives or something, 14 of 14 drives. And uh, then we have these. Uh, hope they work, and they're basically, 80 pin, 80 pin to 68 pin. So in servers, usually the drives were hot swappable. So you have one connector containing uh, data and power. So one connector is cheaper. And those hard drives are still cheaper to buy today. Uh, but uh, a lot of uh, workstations and just your typical computer, if you built one for yourself, it's scarcely you would use the internal 68 pin one and then up Molex for power like here. But uh, those drives are much more expensive usually to buy these days if you find like new old stock something. So uh, we do have some hard drives here. And as you can see here, it's an uh, 80 pin. So that would be hot swappable. You can plug it into in your server in your hot swap bay. So we're gonna use these adapters so we can uh, get this, uh, this 68 pin out. Uh, in your server, your, your backplane on your hotspot bay would have uh, the same 68 pin connector and probably a lot of Molexes for power or something custom. So that's how we're gonna solve that. So that's pretty much it for the parts, I think. Uh, there are some a few more parts we could use. Uh, there is uh, sound cards and so on too. But this, this is what we're gonna try first to uh, deal with. So I'm gonna swap out this graphics card. I think you said it was a TMT2, I'm not sure. It's a PCI, obviously. Uh, so we're gonna put this card in here instead of the Geforce, Geforce 4 MX and see if it gets stuck on the detection of SCSI devices and so on. Uh, so the Geforce 4 MX was detected. So I don't see anything about the SCSI BIOS here, if that's the issue, but it's uh, definitely stuck here. So we have to try something. So we're back in the BIOS here, I'm just gonna disable the SCSI controller in a way, and see if that helps. And we might as well disable the sound card too, if you get a replace there, so. So we will try that to see if that 
improves things or not. I hope it to see something like this operating system of found that would uh, basically tell us that it's uh, the BIOS is trying to hand the system over to the operating system. System boot process failed, but I think it can to try again. So at least that's uh, I think that's progress in the sense that this shouldn't be anything to boot. The fact that they say says so is good. So we're gonna power it down now. Add a different SCSI controller, the Adaptic 19160, with its own hard drive, and see what happens. Gonna put the card in. So here, I check the connection here on the cables. The pins can quite easily get bent in these connect connectors here. It's gonna place it above the graphics card for now, I think. Because when we build the system up, we're gonna pull that cable up anyway, I think. So probably, hopefully, that will work well enough. I'm gonna secure it some screws later before we try it. So no worries there. So as you can see, we're still stuck uh, at the same place with the SCSI controller now installed, the new one. And uh, I can't get anywhere past that. I have a postcard in it. It says 06A6. And that happens with pretty much all the cards. So, I did try two GeForce 2 MX, two GeForce 4 MX cards. One was a 440, and the other one is a 4000 series, but I think that's still a GeForce 4 MX card. Then I tried a TNT2, that didn't work either. I tried a ATI 9250, didn't work, same thing so something uh, there's some incompatibility with cards newer than 97 i think something like that so i've been talking with the owner here since the onboard SCSI is uh, fast SCSI, which is 10 megabyte per second uh, 50 pin and the hard drives are dying we're gonna stick with the card he originally had in it now uh, the tnt 60 megabyte TNT card, and I'm gonna upgrade the SCSI to a Ultra 160 card, so 160 megabytes per second in theory, then. and the two 73 gigabytes 15,000 RPM SCSI drives. We will start by removing the power supply. So, actually, on the rails, you should be able to pull it out, but these cables here sticks out here, so I won't go past. So, I don't really know how they figured that would work. Might not be the original power supply. I think I have to remove the fan. I'm gonna have to remove everything anyway, so we're removing the fan here. See so if you can slide that out uh, upwards as a handle there. So that helps get the power supply out. There was no HP branding on the power supply, so it makes me think it's a replacement.
So here we have the motherboard. It was a bit of a pita to remove because it was only the pressure could slide it up. The owner said so too, but uh, that was not the case. It was uh, very annoying. And from what I could see on the, the board comes delivered. Uh, it has this piece here on always, but uh, this thing here I think should actually be left in the case maybe. Somehow, I don't know. It's a bit weird, but I'm gonna remove it anyways for cleaning and stuff like that. And it is a heavy board with these two coolers on that's for sure. So here we have the RAM obviously, 512 megabytes of ECC and the dual Pentium Pro 200MH, 256kb cache and here are the VRM modules. I can see some caps under here, I'm gonna look at that later. see here how they intended uh, the board to be supported but uh, there's a good like three or four millimeters between there and the case nowadays because it seems to be squished like that probably by that plastic piece and so on seems like we have an onboard CMOS battery of some sort here it might require some replacing I don't know if that's rechargeable or not 5.5 volts 4.6 volts so that's a battery and it's not fully charged so we're gonna strip this board down from all the components like RAM So that's the processor, so I'm going to clean those off before we take them out, I think that's the easiest way. Just using some electronic cleaner here and dissolves most paste very nicely. There you have it, the Pentium Pros. It's a very big socket. Socket 8 it is. Let's see if I can grab it. Quite sticky. Probably been sitting there for well, almost 25 years. So. I'm going to try to remove these VRM modules. Uh -huh. 
Oh, so you pull these and then you pull them up similar to how drain works. That's nice. And that is dirty. So we're probably gonna recap this uh, once I ordered some new ones. So to be able to clean this properly, I need to remove this uh, solder on battery. Water and uh, electricity do not mix. Plus, it's like it's the surprising it still works after 25 years. So I figure we can do a, like a dual 2032 mod with a diode <laughs> that would drop the voltage closer to 5.5. Uh, so that will work. Then you can replace the replace them as they get depleted. That's it. So here we are, we're gonna clean the motherboard and before you scream water and electronics don't mix, they do mix as long as you don't put power on with electronics. So I'm gonna rinse it off first so you can get rid of a lot of the fluffy stuff. This regular soap. I've been using it for a few years, seems to work just fine. Now you could use the silk to distill the water if you don't think your tap water is clean enough, or you could just wrench it up in distilled water when you're done. Or you could use isopropanol to rinse it off, especially if you don't have like a Compressor, so now it's a compressed air, so you can't blow it off. I'm gonna blow this off later, so that will take care of the water on it, under any ships or things like that. Shops here in the factory. So 
So now when you put it in the oven, uh, I use 60 centigrades with the fan on because the fan is really important. It will really help evaporate more than the heat it actually does. So you get any water out from any sockets or any connect connectors or anything. And if you have compressed air, that will really help get the water out on the ships and stuff like that. So if you really want to blow it as dry as you can, then put it in the oven. And like I said, if you don't, if you don't have compressed air, you can pour some alcohol over it. Some is isopropanol, some pure high-grade stuff. Should help remove the water. Make it easier to dry in the oven. So, while we wait for the motherboard to dry, I figure we make an adapter for two CR2032 cells. And I'm going to put them on a cable instead, so we can have them off the motherboard so we can easily replace them. Because where the battery is sitting on the board, you have to take it out and that's pain in the butt. So I figure we put them like this. Put that on that way, I think, so we can have a short cable on in between. I'm gonna go in series, obviously, since we need at least 5.5 volts. And there's a dial, so it's go, we'll go like that. That's to drop the voltage a bit, and uh, just in case, I don't think that's what I really showed you about, but I don't know. So this is just easier, serves two purposes just in case.
pull some pebbles through. I like to pull them through a couple of holes to offload them so you don't rip them off. So that should be the negative. I think that should do it. We can obviously test it out with some uh, 2030 20, cells. I do have it. So if we stick them in here, we should get something like six volts. I hope. Six point one eight. Like I do wonder what we have before the diode. Just for curiosity sake. 6.48 yeah. So they're technically 3 volts each but they're always a little bit extra when on, not on the load and brand new But I think that's fine, I don't... That 5.5 volts is, is probably around 6 volts new too, so... So there we have it, we have our... Well, 2032 adapter for the motherboard, so I'm just gonna solder these in there I think that's the easiest way, and this thing we could just stick somewhere. Might uh, put some shrink wrap over that later, something. So, here we have the motherboard all cleaned up now and dry. So, I figured we're gonna install the CPUs, the memory, and the VRMs, and a graphics card, and uh, test run it on an open bench. But before we do that, I want to take a look at the memory here. So here we have a memory stick and uh, yeah you can see here it's a board job someone done uh, they knocked off two of the resistors there so they bridged one there and the pairs are gone there so they made a board job there this was at the top so I don't know if it has anything to do with that like they somehow hit it when working with the computer this one, you probably can't see it because I also cleaned it so it doesn't help, but this one has some corrosion here, some of the vias here, on both sides, uh, here, you can see it's all green, so corrosion damage on that one, and here's another one, and this one here, let's see, this one over here, it has a uh, second pin from the top left corner that actually is bent upwards. It doesn't touch, so yeah. It also had a tough life, so all these memories to some extent has some damage. The other five haven't seen anything on, but it doesn't mean they don't have any form of damage. So, time to install CPUs and so on then. So time is for some thermal paste here.
everything is installed. I'm just going to add some CR2032 20, 20, to the, this one and connect the power supply in the front panel header and a graphics card and the keyboard. And we should be able to test if it posts or not. Now we have everything assembled for testing. So it's the moment of truth here. Let's see if it posts or not. So we have instant post, that's nice. Can't complain about that. Okay, complaints about the fan to the CPU not being connected, and that's fine. And let's see here date, month, year configure, press enter. Dual Pentium Pros 200s, 256, 512 megs of RAM. Something disabled. Not gonna configure too much now. I just want to set the clock and so on and see, make sure it keeps its uh, memory with the new CMOS plate reinstalled. Oh, I can probably be audio disabled. It seems to remember everything but the clock. But we do have a working system again, so that's good. So next thing to do is actually to order some caps for the VRM. So now the CPU starts to warm up. So now a couple of minutes and they're gonna be too hot. Right now they're about probably around 40, 50 C. So anyways, that's a good result, good progress. So we can move on. So, because we're gonna use uh, all the PCI slots most likely, we can't have this fan on here taking up an extra slot, so it has to go. The original fan doesn't exist anymore, so I figure we use this one. Our plan is to cut out the frame from this one. So, small weight there, should uh, make sure it stays in place. So, when I tried this card out, I realized the fan wasn't spinning. So, I nudged the fan and it started spinning. And then I realized these old cards always use, more or less always use 5 volts to the fan, and this is a 12 volt fan. So, we're kind of lucky there, because if you remove this, we got ground in the middle there. In the middle, I say because we got a pair there. Got five out here. So let me zoom in here. Should help. So you can see this header here. Actually, three pads. The right one is 12 volts. The middle one is ground, and the left one is five volts. So what we really need to do is just add another pin there, and we're gonna have our 12 volts for our fan. Oh, that's a clean hole now. I'll have a small pin here we can add. So we get all three of them here. Let's just see if this works. So that should be like that then. 
Yeah, that works. So I think we should have like 12 volts, 12 volts now. I measured it in the computer. So. so here we have the new caps and one of the VRM modules. So we're gonna start recapping. So here we have a VRM module. So we're gonna remove these caps here. And add some new ones. So first I'm gonna clean the board a little bit. I think it's a little bit dirty. Now to make it easier to desolder these caps, you can use a desoldering gun, but I, I don't have one. Uh, but I do have a hot air station, so I'm gonna preheat the board a little bit. I have my hot air station set to about uh, 160 degrees and 30% airflow. And I do have an infrared ter ter thermometer here if I want to check the temps. I just want to work some heat into the board. That's gonna make it easier for the iron to melt the solder, especially on the opposite side of the cap where the cap is. And we can heat up the caps too, since they're going away anyway, it doesn't matter if they get a little bit hot. We don't want to overheat them, so and we don't want to melt any plastic or anything like that. We just want some heat in everything. It's gonna help, every degree helps. Getting some heat into the caps so they don't act like heat sinks. So Make a good idea here. Probably have to heat the board in between too, depending on how long it takes to go over them all and remove them. Let's see how this works out. I'm gonna secure this so it doesn't flop around. And I'm trying to start with some of the big ones over here. And I got a very pretty big tip here, 4.8. And it's because it retains heat better, so you don't have to like excessively set up the increase in temperature on the iron. And uh, you don't want to overheat the board initially if your tip is too hot. And I like to add some new tin here, some leaded. It's gonna lower the melting point too, and hopefully help remove this. This came out almost too easy. This fell out. That's good. That's what we like to see. Least stress on the board. Also, when you have old tin like this, it might be oxidized and it's gonna be a pain to remove. So that's also why new solder helps, even if you don't have lead f leaded, even some lead free if that's what's already on there. Uh, should help if it's oxidized heavily. So I got two off there. Put a small one over here. Could probably add some flux, but when you're removing, it's not as important. It's more important when you add something. This one was glued. I cut the glue with the razor blade before, so I don't have to deal with that being stuck there. So as you can see, the glue there. We made a bridge, but that's fine as long as we don't power it on with the bridge. We do need to clean out the holes too, so. I'd like to see if I can get both of them at once, that's the that way, yeah, it just drops out. I must say, preheating the board really helps. I just got up first of 70, so that did a loss. But I mean, that's 50 degrees above your ambient, so that's gonna be 50 of them. 
Yeah, iron. You see, it's full out there. That's what I like. Let's fill out. So, yeah. And you can, obviously, if you don't have a hot air station, you can buy a $20 euro heat gun. Just be careful if it doesn't have any temperature settling. You're, you control the temperature by uh, distance then, so you can hold it further away. And, uh, well, if you don't, if you can't measure the temperature, I mean, your fingers if, should work. That was a lot of oxidization there. Ended up being. Actually, gonna add some slight amount of flux for it. Just to keep the tin not oxidizing. Could be some bigger pads on the other side here, probably. One of them. Making the whole thing up tonight. So, we're so gonna put on some heat, I think. We're gonna increase the heat a bit. I can reach maybe quite a temperature. I'll set this to about 200 C, and like I said, distance uh, determines the temperature too. So, and I gotta preheat that cap a bit. Just be careful around plastics and stuff like that, so you don't melt your connectors. They can be quite temperature sensitive. That cap is getting really hot now. So as you can remove it now. And clean your chip in between whenever you put it back. That's how you get a good tip. Feels like it should be able to come out. No, it can. And it's fine. Bit stubborn that one. It looks good here. <laughs> Some dust in between there. Quite dirty in that computer. That one came easily. Just putting them in my recycling bin. Can send them off. The e waste, I got that like 500 meters away, something. and that kind of hot. So, preheat uh, makes it easier. Now, we need to clean the holes in a number of ways. You can wick it out, and uh, obviously, preheating the board would help with that too. So, clamp this down even more. Add some flux now because when you're wicking, your flux really helps. And a lot of wick could, even if they say they have flux in them, I don't trust them. They can be really dry, so add some flux to your wick. You can never have too much flux on that. It'll just make it more difficult and easier to get stuck and so on. And you want a big tip so you can get the heat into the wick so that it doesn't act as a heat sink and you get stuck and rip, rip something. You can rip a trace if you're unlucky. I see as I have a really big tip. It's not always easy to get both holes. Uh, they did come there, I don't know if you can see through the camera. Yeah, there you should be able to see. They're both clean, but that doesn't always happen. Uh, and the tin flows to the heat, so. And what you can use also, you can just cut a small piece of wick and put on the board and drag it with your tip. If, uh, if that's appropriate, like if you're, you're doing something with a lot of paths, like a memory module or something, a ship membership. But since we're only dealing with two at a time here, I don't think that's worth doing. Man, I forgot to clean the tip, but yeah, clean tip, that's important. The only other one of them, but that's probably because there's a pad or something on the side cooling it off that one. Gonna heat up the board a little bit here.
I'm not gonna bother with that hole that didn't get cleaned this time. I'm gonna do these ones first and then we can deal with the annoying ones that have issues. So with the big square ones on the side, this is a big heat plane is here, so it's easy to get those. The other one, the pads are on the other side most likely, so you can check that. But that's probably why those don't want to get sucked out as easily by the wick. I just made a slightly pointy, you can make it quite pointy. I didn't help, but uh, to get it down there in the hole a bit, then you can really get it out that way. Well, but that one anyway. I think not all but this one. First one was a bit annoying. Maybe it wants some cleaning from the side too. Yep, I think that's all of them. I do get pretty dirty. So the hole looks clean enough. Get some new caps in there. Um, this particular card uh, on board. Uh, White goes to white, that's not always the case, so check that first if you haven't taken any pictures. I do recommend it, but I have a second VRM to look at, so I don't need a picture or anything like that right now. These caps are 1000 with 10 volts, and I think the old ones were 1000 UF obviously, and 6.3 volts. But I went with the 10 volts because the same height, the other ones were lower, it doesn't matter. But uh, the price difference was not really there in a way. And a lot of times the 10 volts are cheaper, I find, so I tend to go with those anyway. And higher voltage is all, that's just how much they can take in terms of voltage, so going up a step isn't a problem. Can't go down, but you can go up a little bit at least. I don't know about excessively going over, I've never done that. I see a lot of repair kits going like twice over, so I suppose if 6.3 then it can probably go to 16, but 10 is fine. So that's our 10 volt 1000 UF. I'm gonna need some, uh, I think it's 1000 UF 16 volts now. I think the old ones were. Check the old one. The old one is 10 volts 1000 UF, and the new ones are. 10 volts, 16, uh, yeah, 16 volts, a thousand UF, so microfarad, so also higher rated voltage, on this side, yeah, also the same size, and this one here, we've got negative here and negative up there, so I had to make sure we don't set them, set this one to the same rotation as the other ones, because then we're gonna have a blown up cap and shit later. Let's 
small one somewhere here. It's a 47 microfarad uh, 25 volt. I think the original one was something similar. Um, about the same uh, spec. So. And these are German worth uh, 105 C. They're around 5 to 7,000 hours at 105 C. These ones. I think this is a lot lower though. But small ones. You can get them at the, the uh, higher ratings too sometimes. But uh, more rare, but they don't usually those parts usually don't run that hot, so you're probably fine anyway. So those are our caps in place. Uh, you can solder them back, and yeah, orientation is correct. So I'm gonna change the tip on my iron to a smaller one. I think that's gonna be pretty good to get some heat into a pad. Just pushing the caps up a bit to make sure they are flush. Otherwise, they just look crooked and stupid later. Oh, I think that's all of them. And they seem to be flush and nice. So I'm just gonna cut the legs off. Boring. Should really have a side cutter for this. I don't have one yet. Some of my things I need to buy when I got money list. A mod I need to do to the console that requires a side cutter anyway to get far down enough to add a new screen to it. So yeah, I don't need bits for it to open it too, which I don't have because it's in Bendu. So all it needs now is a clean, and uh, once both are done. I'm gonna clean them and put them uh, to dry in the oven like I did with the motherboard at 60C for like an hour. And uh, yep, yeah, should be fine. To install them and test them. Also, what you can do before you remove the caps, you can measure over the caps, like what the resistance is and stuff like that. Usually, they start charging if the resistance goes up, it's a good sign. And then you can measure afterwards, make sure the same thing happens. Uh, 
So you don't wear short, so that's always good to check out the caps. So here we have our two VRM module, modules. Recapped and clean. So they're ready to go into the system. Yeah, I think the results is looking nice. I just hope they work as well as they look now. So we have the system hooked up again for a second test now with the recap VRMs. So hopefully everything is still working. So we're gonna push the button here. And that's this post, so that's nice. No no magic smoke and anything here. Yeah, microprocessor fan connected, but uh, we know that, so it's fine. Uh -huh. So I never got into the BIOS. I uh, think that uh, the date is somewhat correct here. Yeah. So my CMOS battery mod seems to have worked. Dual uh, Pentium Pro, so both are detected. All the memory. So I think we're good. So the next thing to do is to put the system back together again. So, the motherboard is going back in, and considering the difficulty of getting it out, I don't expect getting it in will be any easier, but we will try. Thing is, it needs to slide in that groove there. Okay. Then we need to push it in that way once we got it all the way down. And there are those rubber pads on the on the back side should protect it. I'm pretty tall too. Because there is like a groove here, you can get this one into it, so I think that's how the figure should get the board in and once it's all the way down, more or less, you should put it in, it's a plastic piece on the bottom too. Let's see here, I need to check what I'm doing with that thing, because we need to get in the land in the thing. inside that piece down there so it means we should probably go backwards now which is back and now I have to check underneath here and it's all fine all three hooks went in by themselves so that's nice so I actually think we're kind of in need to check here there's a hole there and there's a hole in the case too so I think I think we should get a few millimeters forward. And there's a tab here to push on at the time, and one over here. So, yeah. yeah, I think we're in now. It actually went easier than I figured, but getting it loose was apparently a question of things being stuck for so long. I didn't want to give away. The thing is, these notches here needs to go into the holes there. For this thing to be all the way in. So that's the top one, but we need to get the bottom one too. And I don't know what it's hooked up for, that's stopping it from going in. Well, it went in now. So. Those are in, those are in, that means these are in place. Yeah, just need to hook up some stuff. 
So I'm going to try to get the power supply back in again, which was a bit of a problem getting out because it goes this way. This is the rear, and uh, the cable is coming out here. And it's supposed to slide in this sledge shell, but it, you can't get past here. This is stupid. But I, I'm not sure it's the original power supply, and if it is, they apparently ignore their own design. So this thing has to go in something like this. So, and even worse, I need to, or worse, but I need to get the data connected with it here if I can get that in before. So. Yeah, the cable isn't particularly long either, so that's a problem. Really, uh, maybe I can go for it. It's a bit tight though. This is a really bad design. And it needs to be a little more. Also, I think I should get the floppy cable in there while I'm at it. It says see the room on this one, so I suppose they wanted to use the second one then. Not sure that matters, but who knows with these spiders on this board it might actually matter. So I'm just gonna do that. So now we should be able to get this somewhat in position. Cables later, I see now, but nice. So, next thing to do is install the duct. Uh, I cleaned it, so the fan and the duct was quite dirty. So, this should get, get rid of the no fan error, too. Let's see if we can get it in here. So that's the duct installed. Next, we should probably add a graphics card and uh, a piece of speaker and everything like loose, loose bits and pieces so we can start build, building it up with like a SCSI card and a uh, uh, hard drive, obviously. Oh, I'm gonna add the SCSI controller here, all the way up here I think. So that way I get the cable away as soon as possible from everything else. So 
saw me ring the graphics card at the bottom, I think, because of the fan. Uh, if I want it with it too, I think I want it here, because the RAM on those things sticks out a lot, especially on the backside. So it might collide with the fan. I'll just obstruct it, and I figure we add the network card under the SCSI card here. So we're two and the network card. And of course we have our creative uh, Sound Blaster AWE64. It's supposed to be a faster these cards, you may, uh, just like we talked about network card compared to Solid 16. I, I don't know, I don't I haven't tri tried it, but the owner says so, so we're gonna install this card because he wants that. And that might be a case, I just haven't tried it myself, so I'll just sit with the screw. So. So, we're ready to test this thing out. I've installed two optical drives in the front. I think one is not ID, well, not traditional. I think it's a really old one supposed to go with a creative sound card. So, they did not hook that up. And then we have a slot loader, which is set to master. And it's probably broken. I would suspect both of them to be that. Uh, Flop is connected, hopefully, it works. So, we have to see if this now works. and. If we have to swap one of the drives, uh, the optical drives or not. <coughs> but right now I want to see if it finds the SCSI drives or not. So let's power it on and see what happens. And the proper drive made floppy noises, so that's a good thing. I think we have. Uh, might have to really switch the cable on that floppy, but uh, I'm pretty sure I didn't uh, set that up wrong. So I just had to use the SCSI BIOS for that after card coming up, so that's nice. Let's we'll see if it finds our drives. Well, it shouldn't take this long, I think something's up with the uh, identification of the drives. Oh. Either those adapters not working or I haven't configured them properly. But, uh. So, uh, I'm gonna try the machine now. I have swapped the SCSI card from the top slot to the second one from the top because the machine didn't want to work. It, the SCSI card was detected, but it got all kind of weird errors whenever trying to find a drive, even a good known drive with the 68 pin that I have that have worked on exactly the same kind of card. And I even tried my cables and everything. So, trying other slots, it obviously works. So, the one I picked that was closest to the top, which was convenient, obviously didn't work. And I have been reading up on this machine on Vogons, and it's apparently notoriously picky on option rooms, which means your graphics card bias, your SCSI bias, probably network card bias if you have one for that, etc. etc. So, we're gonna be ready to push Control A for entering the SCSI BIOS here. Mm. Should detect two drives now, I hope. I oh, didn't see anything with the configure SCSI controller settings. SCSI disk. Scanning now here, so we get something. Yeah, so ID2 and ID4, and I don't know how they ended up 2 and 4 because. I figured I said zero and one, and I realized to get the uh, zero, you just don't use a jumper on ID zero on the PCB. So I removed that and set that to. I could just remove it, but I want to keep the jumper, so I set that on the ID two there. So I figured that would be one, but this is ID four here. It seems to like be a multiple of two, so I don't know what this is up. The way I configured it was one there and one there, but 
It really doesn't matter. Uh, we have two drives. I could hardly fit two in there, and the power supply can use as most has four amps on the 12 volt array. So the other two scattered drives are one and a half amp each. So that's two, three more amps, and these are 800 milliamps on the 12 volt. So we decided no more drives until at least we got the power supply upgrade because this one isn't that strong. It's 200 watts. 29 amps on the 5 volt and 4 on the 12 volt, so a bit uh, it's like a no name one. I think it's been replaced and it's pretty shitty. But anyway, we have uh, two dri drive Seagates uh, and they're running right now. The only thing making noises here is the mostly the GPU fan. On a boot, Windows 2 has an opt optical drive and then uh, hit the F6 button to. Uh, select third party driver install so we can install the SCSI drivers. I'm gonna push the disk in and push F6 here to install the SCSI drivers. So push S here and enter. So I'm gonna select the first option here. So I'm gonna make one that is like 2 gigs or something. For Windows for now, now we can do the rest from Windows. So, anyway, this is a disk 0 ID2, so that should be the first one. So, makes sense to use that one. I'm gonna show the NTFS here. So we installed the uh, Windows 2000 and it will boot. And the reason is this motherboard can only boot its own onboard SCSI. So if you disable that, you can't boot. Now you can see here integrated disabled SCSI BIOS not available and you can't change that. Set that enable, that will be enabled and you can disable it. The problem is if you push F1 there. But it says set SCSI BIOS to enable if you want to start boot the computer from the SCSI disk. The SCSI BIOS is not available if the SCSI interface is disabled. So basically the way I interpret this is like if you they will only allow you to boot from SCSI if you're using the onboard one basically. So you could obviously have a 50 pin onboard uh, hard drive or a 80 pin with a 50 to 80 pin adapter and boot from that. But you wouldn't benefit from the extra speed of the one more modern hard drive. Um, so it comes back to that whole 10 megabytes per second on the onboard one. Uh, so yeah, it doesn't matter what I set, even if I set the right disk in the uh, Adaptex BIOS, that it should boot. As long as the motherboard doesn't tell the SCSI card it, it's allowed to boot, it won't do it anyway. So I tried one of those compact flash adapters. Uh, and they didn't work because you can't set the, the IDE configuration of the drives manually. Uh, let's look here. And here I have a IDE device connected that can be auto configured automatically there. And you can set different things. That one works. And you can't set your cylinders, head, and sectors manually. So a compact flash adapter doesn't work. So what I have here is actually a Two and a half inch SATA, uh, two and a half inch IDE SSD. So it, it looks like a typical uh, SATA. This is a SATA one, but uh, it has a 40 pin IDE in there and the laptops. So it's basically intended to upgrade an old laptop with IDE connector to uh, an SSD. So I used that, use an adapter for that to get over to the traditional three and a half inch IDE connector. He's, that was sent with the system, a uh, couple of different SSDs, one being ID. That the system can detect automatically. So it looks like we have to install Windows on an SSD, which is kind of annoying. But you can still run your games, your programs, store your files, and everything on the SCSI drives, obviously. So, yeah. 
and I don't know how fast the IDE connector on this motherboard is, it's probably not 8833 even, it's probably Pio mode or something horrible. So the first one there, 30528MB is our SSD, and we have a two, we have our two SCSI drives, and I still don't get this down here, but whatever. So we're gonna use this one, create a partition here. gigabytes it's more than enough and then we can uh, partition like the, the rest of it from Windows so yeah and we're gonna run NTFS there So finally we have Windows 2000 installed, let's check here, number of CPUs, test manager, we have two CPUs, and let's see RAM here, we have half a gig of RAM, so that adds up. So here we have the final system, up here on the top, hidden here we have a 73 GB 15,000 RPM SCSI drive. Below it, we have a 32 GB IDE SSD as a boot drive. Below it, we got another 73 GB 15,000 RPM SCSI drive. Then we have two optical drives. The top one is connected and working. And inside here, we have the RAM, eight sticks, half a gig. And this is the CPU cooler. The one CPU is behind there and another one behind the power supply. I had to rearrange the uh, add-on cards a bit. So in the top we have the Voodoo 2. After that we have a SCSI card, after that we have a TNT card and below that we have a network card. And I had to replace the AN983B with the uh, MPX5038B. Uh, Array. and it's apparently the same as an as a UMC 1211 so Windows actually drives for it the reason why I had to rearrange and do that was because the only slot I could install the network drivers for the AN983 was in the top slot and on the PCI slot it wouldn't recognize the card and uh, therefore not ins I couldn't install drivers but in the top slot it refused to get uh, an IP address and I also tried this at other card in all slots and only the bottom one works so the system is super picky about what card to put in it and where but this combination now works and we can remove this because we don't need that anymore and below that we have the uh, AWE64 the sound blaster and that works too so we have a fully working system now, now finally after a lot of trial and error uh, the thing is with the network card 2 is that like even uh, the AN983 cost a lot of blue screens so that wasn't very helpful either also this card cost blue screens in, a, in the other slots but not the bottom one so there it works I couldn't even get into the desktop before it crashed uh, in the upper slot but there were the two cards that require any IDQ or anything like that. It seems to be happy in the top slot. I tested out uh, both the Wood 2 and the TNT card in games and they do work as intended. So all we have to do now is actually put on the cover and boot it up. So we are in Windows here. And uh, I have some benchmarks, uh, not that important, but this is the SSD. It does just over 3.2 megabytes per second because it's not uh, not supporting 
uh, like uh, Ultra 33 ATA. So it's Pyre mode, so it's quite slow, but we only have Windows for that. And then we have the SCSI drives, which performs more like ATA Ultra 66 here. It actually beats that drive a little bit. So around 25 megabytes per second and 3 millisecond access time. So the games are installed to the SCSI drives and we can uh, we can run here uh, Quake 2 for example. It's gonna run on the boot 2 if I recall. I uh, got, got the best results there with some tweaks. So we can do a time demo. This is 800 by 600, uh, relatively high settings. It looks good enough. Thirty nine point three. If I would run it again, I would get like forty. Uh, it's always faster the second time, usually. So that's Quake 2, and we got Quake 3, and I think I ran that on the TNT card because uh, the drivers and the game support SMT there. Uh, the, you need a Voodoo 4 at least to do that with the 3 FX card. And this is uh, the owner's special version of Quake 3. It, it looks like this. It's super com. It's like uh, it, it shrunk all the images and stuff, compressed them. Uh, it not his configs though. It, they are. They, they looked uh, like there were things missing, so I had to take another slightly tweak config files. So it's probably not performing as well as it it could do, but uh, it's fast enough considering. I can't actually remember the minimum requirements, but I mean, if you had a K6 to 400 or 450, that was not that fast. So. But this is set to use both CPUs. So we got 36.8 frames and I would say that's pretty impressive for a 200 megahertz system. I think he said he got over 40 but uh, like I said I couldn't make the config files work or if they're supposed to look that bad as they did, I don't know. So that is uh, Quake 3. I also installed some Unreal Tournament here and I get about, with the Wood 2 I get about 26 to 27 frames average so it's not particularly fast but it's uh, quite CPU heavy game compared to uh, like the graphics side of things the graphics card isn't that important in Unreal Tournament and I found the Voodoo 2 to be the fast one the TNT was kind of laggy even in the menus so I settled for the Voodoo 2 here I won't run a demo here, it takes way too long, but we could start a practice session here with a couple of bots maybe. I usually run the one with a benchmark, but we set it to three. And we're also gonna go out here and turn on time demo statistics. So this game isn't configured at all for the keyboard so. but as you can see you're down in the like 60 17 there sometimes it 
it's somewhat playable, but I wouldn't call it uh, eSport competitive and it's the frame drops are quite high sometimes so. But uh, considering it's, it's under spec, I think you need like a Pentium MMX233. And it does use MMX, I think, for the sound and stuff. So a 200 MHz Pentium Pro doesn't have MMX, so it's a bit on the slow side. And uh, I'm not sure it uses both CPUs or not. Uh, especially not with the 2, but I don't know. But yeah, you can play it for fun. So yeah, there's, there are some games running on it now. So yeah, this is it then. The machine is working, it's done, more or less. We could uh, try to get a 50 pin adapter to 80 pin and so we could use a SCSI drive from the hard drive, con SCSI controller. That, should, that would be faster than the ID one, but we don't have one right now, so that might be a future upgrade to look into. Uh, possibly a new power supply. This one is kind of weak on a 12 volt for if you want to add more SCSI drives. So that's one thing. So yeah. So thank you for watching and uh, see you another time.